Physics is a notoriously difficult subject. The math is complicated, the principles are subtle, and even when students pass the final exam, they frequently fail simple conceptual questions designed to test whether they really understood anything. Given this difficulty, it makes sense that we should strive to more effective ways to teach and learn physics. Jennifer Doctor and Jose Maestre provide an elegant summary of the relevant research on evidence-based instructional practices in their book, The Science of Learning Physics. Why is physics so hard to learn? While learning the math underpinning physics isn't easy, Dr. and Maestri argue that it's actually the conceptual reasoning that proves more difficult to overcome. We are born into a physical world, and thus nature has endowed us with intuitions for dealing with physical objects. Unfortunately, these intuitions don't line up with the deeper theories discovered by scientists. Most people reason like Aristotle. We think objects stop moving when we stop applying a force, that the force on a ball thrown directly up is continuously changing, or that when two objects collide, the bigger one exerts a greater force on the smaller one. Instead, we'd like them to reason like Newton, and eventually Einstein, that objects in motion tend to stay in motion without an external force, that the force on a ball thrown up is constant, it's just gravity, and that every action causes an equal and opposite reaction. This failure to reason properly about physics is not immediately overcome after a college semester. Instead, Dr. and Maestri argue for a knowledge and pieces view of building physics understanding. In this account, students don't overcome their misconceptions simply by being taught the correct solution. Instead, they acquire a correct understanding piecemeal, sometimes exhibiting correct reasoning and in other cases falling back on naive but misleading intuitions. Developing conceptual reasoning is different from merely being able to proficiently solve textbook problems, as it's possible to memorize how to solve a problem without any understanding of why the process works. How do physicists think about physics? The aim of physics is to produce more expert-like reasoning about physical problems. To that end, psychologists have devoted considerable time studying expert-novice differences in many fields, including physics. These studies take a snapshot comparing the reasoning patterns exhibited by domain experts, in this case usually physicists, and novices, people who have taken an undergraduate class or two. Some of the common findings from this line of research include experts see principles, novices see surface features. Asked to categorize physics problems, experts organize them based on the basic principle involved. Novices, in contrast, focus on surface features like whether the problem involves a ramp or a pulley. Experts reason forward, novices reason backwards. Experts start from the givens of a problem and pick the right formulas to apply to get intermediate quantities needed to solve the problem. Novices, in contrast, start with the goal and try to find equations that solve for that goal and then work backwards from there. This latter approach is more mentally demanding, which is one reason why physics problems are so hard for beginners. Experts spend more time studying a problem, novices rush to calculate right away. While experts generally solve problems faster than novices, they spend more time proportionally trying to understand the problem itself. Novices, lacking the ability to effectively categorize what kind of problem it is, tend to rush off to calculate things in hopes that it will lead to a solution. One way to understand these differences is that experts have sophisticated schemas or organizing patterns that cause them to perceive problems in terms of the principles underlying their solution. Novices, who lack these patterns, tend to reason instead through plugging and chugging numbers into available formulas or by making direct analogy to memorized problems of the same type. Can the deep ideas of physics be taught better? Doctor and Maestri are optimistic that there are better ways of teaching physics than the typical approach, which is a professor lecturing to an audience, perhaps occasionally showing an example or a derivation with homework problem sets. One strategy the authors believe shows promise is making explicit the reasoning process that goes into solving a physics problem. Instructors, whose schemas make the correct next move in a physics problem obvious, tend to focus on the underlying math and offer less guidance about why a particular equation needs to come first. If teachers can instead model the entire problem-solving process, not just the algebraic steps, but the conceptual reasoning that allows them to decide whether a problem is one of conservation of momentum or energy, students will hopefully clue in on the expert mode of reasoning sooner than might be expected simply by doing tons and tons of problem sets. Once multiple principles have been introduced, it may be wise to explicitly teach and practice categorizing problems. Since this is such an important feature of expert problem solving, physics classes would do better if they spent more time practicing how to distinguish problem types, not merely solving them. The authors also strongly advocate for active learning. Active learning involves the student constructing knowledge, not merely passively receiving it. It typically advocates for problem solving, hands-on experimentation and exploration, and frequent testing and feedback in the learning process. 
Some strategies for implementing active learning that receive some evidence and support include frequent testing and retrieval practice. Students tend to prefer reading their notes even though they learn more from attempting to solve problems. Interleaving examples with testing. This can help offset some of the cognitive load problems of pure problem solving while still encouraging active practice among students. Desirable difficulties, spacing, retrieval, and interleaving different examples side by side have all been shown to enhance learning even though students tend not to realize their effectiveness. Flipped classrooms. So video lectures can be given for homework with the actual practice taking place in the classroom where peers and teachers can offer feedback and help. Clicker questions and pair and share. Interrupting the flow of the lecture for brief quizzes not only encourages learning, but it informs teachers when their explanations aren't hitting the mark. Self-explanations. Students who try to explain worked examples or their own solutions understand the problems better than those who don't. Some final thoughts. Overall, I enjoyed this book, and given its slim size, I highly recommend it to anyone who has to teach or learn physics. I suspect many of the same ideas would apply to any STEM-based subject, although certainly the challenges of learning organic chemistry or molecular biology differ somewhat from classical mechanics. My only concern with the book is that it largely sidestepped controversies over the empirical status of educational theories. In a prominent paper, Lin Zhang, John Sweller, Paul Kirchner, and William Coburn argue that the support for problem-based inquiry and other pedagogical innovations has been overstated. They argue that many experiments offered in support of reform approaches have altered many aspects of instruction at once, while carefully controlled studies aimed at assessing the efficacy of the components of those instructional strategies have often not supported their use. For instance, problem-based learning is a popular approach to active learning, arguing that students should be taught less and spend more time actively solving problems. However, Sweller's research has found that novices learn faster and perform better after studying examples than solving problems for themselves. Similarly, inquiry-based approaches, which model the learning process on the way physicists do science, may be less effective than more direct instruction. My impression from the ongoing controversies is that active learning should not be confused with unguided learning. It's important for students to think actively, try to understand deep concepts, and see the broader context in which textbook problems are situated. But it also seems clear that student activity cannot be a substitute for thorough and explicit teaching. For a physics student, it seems clear that ample practice and examples are important, but that we should also be focused on trying to understand why certain problems are solved the way they are, not just mindlessly inserting equations, but stepping back and asking which principles are at work, and hopefully getting some feedback from peers and teachers to see if our intuitions are correct. 